Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to give a talk today. My subject is the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and to me, it is Israel's holy grail. Now, uh, my interest in the talk began really many, many years ago. I considered in the 1970s writing, um, making a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in those days I was heavily involved in ch with church life and um, I was interested in the Ark and I began studying it then. Then I came out of the church and went on to a diff completely different path and I went on to, began to explore other philosophies uh, and look into the movement and very quickly uh, found myself uh, drifting out of church. In fact, I left church completely in 1995 and began to study alternative philosophies, occult philosophies, and I found them really quite startling. Then in 2005, I began to read a wonderful book by James Hurtak called The Keys of Enoch. And while I was reading this book, I had a vision of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which I thought was really nice. This was in the March. And then I was in Cyprus in the July uh, on a holiday, and I was just lounging around on a balcony watching the sunset over the Mediterranean, and I was musing on... Uh, Stargate and I, I had this crazy daydream of building a Stargate in my living room and uh, which is <laughs> really mad stuff but I'm, I do mad things because I've always been interested in other dimensions and other planes of existence and how to contact them and uh, how to travel to those planes of existence and how they can travel to us. Uh, I began to think about this, um, building Stargate. So I come back to Glastonbury uh, after my holiday, and I meet Sue Chapman, who um, runs, or used to run, the Glastonbury branch of the Wessex Research Group. And she said, I've been listening to an interview with a man called Kenneth Hutchison. He's into free energy, uh, lives in America, and he's built a replica of the Ark of the Covenant, and um, has run all sorts of tests and he claims he's had entities coming through. And she said, why don't you build one and we could run our tests, you see, on the Ark and see what we get. So I said, well, that's fantastic. Okay, let's do it. So I went off to B&Q and I went... <laughs> <laughs> to get some wood and so forth duly built it, which I will explain a little bit about it, uh, about the building of it in a, in a few moments. First of all, I should explain to those of you who maybe don't know what the Ark of the Covenant actually is. The Ark of the Covenant was the holiest, most sacred object in the nation of Israel when they were a nation. This is during the times of King David and King Solomon, those periods, about... Um, Eight or 900 BC. <clears throat> now, um, it was the throne of God. When Israel, uh, you probably know the story for those of you who've been to Sunday school, Israel was held in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. And Moses is raised up as a leader for the Israelite nation leads the people of Israel out of Egypt, miraculously parting the Red Sea, and they go through. And they come to Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, God puts in a perfect experience. And when you read that experience in the Bible, it sounds like um, that wonderful scene at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when that massive mothership comes down over the mountain. Well, at Mount Sinai, God put in a with thunder and lightning and the sound of trumpets uh, as he appeared. And he took Moses up to the mountain and he gave him the Ten Commandments. And uh, also gave him a, uh, a tabernacle to build, a tent, for God to live in. And he also gave him the pattern for a box, which is called an ark. And this, was, uh, this box would be the box that would hold the Ten Commandments. And um, uh, it was, it was a, the most sacred document. The Ten Commandments 
judgment between God and man. And the God of Israel was going, would said he would enthrone himself above the ark. <coughs> now, <coughs> here is the high priest uh, of Israel as he would be um, in the wilderness. Here's the children of Israel all camped up here in the wilderness. And this is the tent or tabernacle that Moses was commanded to build. And here we have the high priest preparing himself to go into the Holy of Holies where he would see the, th the uh, where he would meet with God in front of the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> and uh, so he would be there and God would put in this personal appearance and reveal himself there so the object itself was very very powerful had a very powerful significance this is where God was going to meet this was where the other ones were going to touch the earth plane and the notion that I had was that perhaps we too could if we built the ark which is the most powerful esoteric object in the world, perhaps in the universe, maybe we will open up uh, a, uh, a way through to other dimensions. So, we duly set about building this ark. <coughs> um, no, I'll go into that one afterwards, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> so, I buy the wood. Because the, the Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood, um, which is in a, a very, very strong wood. It's known as the eternal wood because it's so closely grained, it will almost not disintegrate at all. It will last forever, or virtually. Uh, so I go to B&Q and I get, the, um, I get some wood, uh, pine wood. I couldn't get acacia wood. It's very hard to get in this country. And I'm walking along the road with my pine wood up Glastonbury High Street and I bump into Colin who's a brilliant, brilliant carpenter. And I said, he said to him, oh, where are you going with that? I said, oh, you're not going to believe this, but I'm going home to make the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he said, oh yeah. He said, um, he said, how are you going to do that then? I said, well, really, I haven't got a clue. I'm not very good at carpentry. He said, well, I'll build it for you. So, uh, knowing how good Colin was, I said, well, it has to be precise measurements. He said, don't worry about that. So he set to and began to build it. Now, I will give a description to you of the Ark of the Covenant. This is um, what is actually, what the Bible, the Old Testament, actually says about it. Ah, <coughs> oh, I need my... Could we have the lights on just for a brief moment? <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> have them make a chest of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold, both inside and out. Make and make a gold moulding around it. Cast four rings for it and fasten them to its four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put in the ark then put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. That's the Ten Commandments. Make a cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide, and make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover at the two ends. The cherubim are to have their wings spread upwards, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim are to face each other, looking toward the cover. Place the cover on top of the ark, and put the ark, and put in the ark the testimony which I will give you. There, above the cover between the two cherubim that are over the ark of the testimony, I will meet with you and give you all my commands for the Israelites. So. It's two and a half cubits 
wide by one and a half cubits, uh, what, two and a half cubits wide, one and a half cubits high, and one and a half cubits deep. Right. That equates to about 45 inches by 27 inches, which is a pretty large object, about the size of a household fridge, which would be far too big and far too expensive for me to make. But fortunately, Kenneth Hutchinson, who run his experiments in America, said that the experiments would work just as well with a scaled-down model. So I reduced all the measurements from inches down to centimetres, and I made an object that was acceptable in size. And this is the object. <coughs> this is a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> and it is 45 centimetres... <coughs> It is 45 centimetres uh, wide or long, 27 metres high, 27, metres, 27 centimetres high, 27 centimetres deep. Now, <coughs> the original arc was overlaid, was made of wood, which you see Colin doing there, and was overlaid with uh, gold. Uh, inside and outside. He Kenneth Hutchison said that when he conducted his experiments he did not use gold, he used gold lacquer. So I thought okay I'll do what Kenneth Hutchison did. I got gold lacquer and I lacquered um, the arc inside and outside. Uh, I overlaid the... Uh, I, I mixed in with the gold lacquer some monatomic gold into the lacquer. Um, that was affordable. If I'd used real gold to cover that, I wouldn't, I'd have had to sell my house, as you can imagine. Now, with the construction of the ark, I was having the most appalling job. I got the box bit okay, and um, I got the box bit okay, that wasn't a problem, but the cherubim, I was having a devil of a job with it. And my uh, dear friend, Tony Kennish, who used to be a design engineer, said, well, don't worry, I'll give you a hand. And uh, he came up with a design for the cherubim, and we got together, and we worked on building the cherubim. Now, I don't want this to fool you. This might look like cardboard. It is. <coughs> and we got the cardboard, and uh, wire mesh, and... We covered it, the whole thing in clay, um, with a bit of luck. It, are you, you, oh, you've got it? Okay. We covered the whole thing with clay. <coughs> there we go. We covered the whole thing with clay, and then we painted it gold. <coughs> and then, on the great day, I think this is a great day, uh, there it is, we got ready. That was the one. Thank you. On the great day, we played the Hallelujah Chorus. <laughs> yes, we did. We played the Hallelujah Chorus. Oh, we were younger then, you see. We played the Hallelujah Chorus, and we placed the lid on top of the ark. The lid, incidentally, was made of a piece of sheet metal. <clears throat> and we were ready uh, to begin our experiments. But, but it was almost ready. Before we, did, before we got ready, I decided that it would be a good idea to program the arc with sound. It was just something, I thought if I impregnate it with sound, it'll give it extra energy. So what I did, I played in the first five books of the Bible, which is the law of Moses, because this answers to the Israelitish law which is the laws of Moses. So I played the first, by, I have got them on audio, and I played them in, I put speakers inside the ark, speakers around the ark, and just played it. It took weeks. <laughs> God, it was boring. <laughs> but it just went on and on. Anyway, programmed that in, and then I thought, I I've ha also have an, a, a recording of the electromagnetic resonance of the planets recorded by the Voyager space probe and sent back, to the, sent back to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So I thought, what could be better than the true music of the spheres? So I played that into the arc as well for a couple of weeks. And so the whole thing was impregnated with sound through and through. 
and then um, we were ready to begin our various experiments. I will show you what the ark contained. The ark accident actually contained three objects. It contained, let me remove the lid, <coughs> it contained um, a golden pot of manna. When Israel went through the wilderness, they were fed on a miraculous food called manna. Now, manna is very difficult to get hold of these days. Uh, so we used rice flakes instead. Uh, so I got a, um, a pot from TK Maximus and painted it um, gold and filled it with rice flakes. And here we are. Got, that represents the manna. <coughs> that was to commemorate Israel's journey through the wilderness. The ark also contained the staff that the high priest of Israel would have used, Aaron. And uh, that staff is reputed, was made of al a piece of almond wood and is reputed to have budded and blossomed miraculously. And uh, so, remember, this isn't the original rod. This is a scaled down model. So... <laughs> I was in Spain on holiday and the almond trees, it was springtime, and the almond trees had just begun to blossom. And I cut myself off a sprig of the almond, a sprig of almond rod and uh, to symbolise Aaron's rod, Aaron's staff. Incidentally, if the Ark of the Covenant was about the size of a household fridge, which isn't very big, his staff wouldn't have been like a great big Gandalf staff that you see in the movies. It probably wouldn't have been much bigger than a walking stick, when you think about it. Probably no higher than about that. That would have been Aaron's staff. It was a symbol of his power. It was a symbol of his authority to be high priest. And finally, it contained the Ten Commandments. Now, for these, we managed to get hold of stone tiles. And I'm, I don't, I don't read Hebrew. Does anybody here read Hebrew? Okay. Uh, I know you're filming, but would you like to read these? But because these are, this, these were engraved by Tony, Tony Kenish. Um, they are um, the Ten Commandments written in Hebrew. And um, they were written, for, according to our researches that we did, on both sides of the stones. One, ten commandments on one stone, the same ten commandments copied on the other. In effect, one, one set of commandments for Israel, one set of commandments for God. That's what they symbolise. And so we put them in there. And as I said, we programmed them with sound, and we were ready to go. <coughs> First of all, we connected, I'm sorry, thank you. This is my plucky assistant, by the way. <laughs> I apologize. <coughs> I trust you implicitly. <coughs> we did not know what to do for the first um, experiment. I mean, we haven't got a clue. We were, we were like mad scientists. So, uh, I thought it would be a good idea fool, uh, to get 150 metres of uh, electric bell wire, wrap it round the arc and connect it to batteries and see what would happen. So we connected it to a battery and not a lot happened. So we decided to connect it to the mains in our... <laughs> <laughs> and we blew the fuses out in the kitchen. <laughs> and the arc shook violently for a second... And for a second and a half. <laughs> and, uh, but it actually felt as if we were doing something very, very cruel to the ark. And it was then that we began to realise that the ark was, was, in some way, had a kind of a life of its own. And we thought we, we should back off. So we stopped doing that. But before we did that, we took a, we took a photograph, a friend of mine, uh, Phil David 
came up and he said, I'd like to photograph your arc and see if, I said, I've been, managing, I've been photographing orbs and I'd like to see if I could get anything. And we got this, we got l nearly a hundred pictures of orbs. I've only brought half a dozen or so along to show you. But this was the first photograph he took. And as you see, this beautiful, beautiful orb appeared just there. <coughs> and uh, we did the next photograph of orbs. Somewhere? <laughs> Where is it gone? Yes, a little one appeared just there over the wings of the cherubim. So things are going really, this is encouraging for us. <coughs> And then we got this real beauty here. Can you see that? A massive orb. Now, how big are orbs? The fact is, we don't really know because I personally believe, and um, I know many of my friends also believe this, that these are beings from another plane of existence. Therefore, they do not correspond to our three-dimensional world. So they could be any distance away from us. They could be right up close, in which case they would appear big. Or they could be uh, really quite, they, they could really be quite small, but because they're up close, they appear big. Or maybe they are big, we just don't know. But there's another beauty down here. Another big one. <coughs> and there's another little one here. I beg your pardon? Yeah, I, uh, yes, I haven't seen that. Now, this is the funny thing with these orbs. Very, very strange. Um, this is something else we've noticed. Sometimes when I give talks, the orbs appear to change. Um, they change size, they change shape, and orbs appear where there wasn't orbs before. In the photographs. In the photographs. We've watched the, we've literally, at the beginning, we literally watched the photographs change. At, it's not all, just one or two of them were changing. And there's another orb down here. Uh, there's Tony and Sue and myself. And here's another, there's a real beauty down here. Nice little snowball of an orb. Um, this was, ta all these photographs, by the way, were taken in the assembly rooms in Glastonbury. <coughs> and then we got this one. Now, can you see anything special about that? Yes. A face. Where do you see the face? What, up here? Yes. Correct. There's a face there. Now, and also, what is this? Now, was this the camera juddering? What is that? It might have been camera judder, but that is very interesting. Now, the thing is, this one, we, uh, Phil David took the photographs and he showed us photographs. We all looked at the photographs and we saw nothing. Three weeks later, a lady came round to my house. She said, I'd like to see the pictures of your ark. And she's looking through the photographs. She says, Oh my God, that face there! <laughs> and uh, I said, no, don't be so silly. She said, yeah, there's a face. And I looked, and there was. And not one of us had seen the face in those photographs. <coughs> so, Tony Kenish said, um, actually, I think the other one would be better. Yeah, Tony Kenish said, well, give it to me. I'm going to take it with me, and I'll do some uh, work on it. I, I will... Um, uh, process it, uh, you know, contrast and so forth. So we added contrast to it, and that's what came up. But he added more contrast, and this is what we got. <coughs> now, this is what we got. <coughs> now, I don't know how clear all this is to you, but here is the face here. Eyes, nose, mouth. 
Now, what kind of a face is that? A child, right? Is the mouth open or is the mouth closed? Who thinks it's open? Okay, who thinks it's closed? Okay, who thinks it's a child? Is it a man? Is it male? Is it female? It could be, actually, it could be anything. Now, there's more to this face than meets the eye because he computer enhanced it, it revealed other details because you see this is sort of a cloud around it here. But look, there's a mouth there and an eye. There's a face slightly in profile. Alongside it is another face and um, I don't know how clearly you can see that but there seems to be a horn coming out of the being's head. Now, also, above the face is a, a huge eye up here. Uh, you can see it on the original photographs probably more clearly. I don't know what you're getting from back there if you can see that. There's an eye there, sort of an almond-shaped eye, and another eye over here. Like there's another big face overlooking this face. This face itself is also made up of other faces. <coughs> there's a mouth here, a nose, this eye here, and over here. It actually would appear to be a composite face. Now, when we go back and look at the other one, and look at the photograph that we based all this on in the first place, thank you. <coughs> uh, it's reversed, but it doesn't matter. That was just flash from the camera. That's all it was, was just flash reflecting on there. But what I believe was happening was that light is a very subtle form of matter. And spirit, I believe that, those, that is a spirit photograph, and I believe that spirit was able to take that photograph, take the light rather, from the flash, and bend it around itself, giving itself substance for that brief instant, giving itself shape and substance, so that you could actually see, uh, so that it could make itself visible to us. <coughs> I've never seen a photograph like this before. Thank you. <coughs> so, what is happening here? Something's definitely going on. Um, the arc is producing, was beginning to produce manifestations. Now, I took it to the Theosophical Society. I'll put the lid back on. <coughs> I took it to the Theosophical Society, where I was asked to give a one-day seminar on the arc. And I gave my seminar on the arc, and there was a lunch break and at the time I invited people to bring dowsers along and to douse the energies around the ark and as uh, they were dowsing the energies the guy who was recording it put on some rock music who was recording the talks during the lunch break put on a bit of rock music and the dowsers wouldn't work around the ark at all and uh, in fact they just went haywire didn't make any sense whatsoever. So, what we did, uh, or what they did, they said, turn that music off. So he turned it off, and the dowsers started to work perfectly again. And then he put some Mozart on, and um, instead of the rock music, and the dowsers worked even better. <coughs> so, I get back to Glastonbury after that, after this seminar, and I phoned up Tony Kenish and I phoned up Zig Lonegrin who's just given us that wonderful talk and um, because Zig uh, is as you probably know is probably one of the best dowsers uh, in the world today and um, I told them what had happened and they said we'll come round and we checked and uh, we ran some tests and we, I put the Rolling Stones on 
in the kitchen and we doused the energy and um, the energy collapsed almost to zero to about out here almost nothing no energy whatsoever and it actually felt as if we were doing something terribly cruel to the ark so what we did I put Mozart on and the energy just bounced out and Tony and Zig both measured the energy around the ark and the energy was really handsome then I put on some Gregorian chants and the energy bounced out even further and I also have a recording of Hebrew chants so I put the Hebrew chants on uh, the chant was Kadosh Kadosh Adonai Sabaoth or something like that which means holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty and put that on and the energy bounced out even further uh, the energy was increasing more and more depending on the type of music that it was listening to that it was surrounded by it implies there's some sort of uh, life force or something <sighs> animating the art I'm I say life force it's an inanimate object it's wood and it's well for me wood and 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 um, gold lacquer and clay and paper but yet it's alive in some way then uh, Dean Carter uh, who's over there with Lorna uh, they came round because uh, Dean is a brilliant at overtoning and, and playing with the singing bowls and he came round and he overtoned over the ark and uh, played the singing bowls and Lorna was taking photographs there was one very significant photograph which she took at the time I don't know if you've still got it um, where um, Dean is kneeling on the ground um, in front of the ark playing the bowls I believe at the time and, and overtoning and his legs have vanished all there is is mist all around the ark and a covering over um, over Dean's legs just mist nothing else uh, very very peculiar when psychic people come in contact with the ark the ark's energy measurably increases when we first built the ark the ark had a radius of energy of 14 feet so that means seven feet that way seven feet that way seven feet that way seven feet that way and seven feet that way Sorry? That's a diameter of 14 feet. I beg your pardon. A diameter of 14 feet. Correct. It had a diameter of 14 feet. Thank you. <coughs> when, as we began to run our tests on it, uh, some psychic people came down. And a, a couple. And they came down because they'd heard about the, that I was building the art. They wanted to see it. The, en the radius went out after their visit to 25 feet. The diameter went out to 25 feet in all directions. It then went out, uh, a psychic group came round and it just filled, a, few, a week or two later, it just filled the whole of the living room with its energy. And um, on one occasion, um, I'll let Zig tell you this, um, the energy had increased incredibly. How far would you say it was when you came round that time? Well, it was down by the attic, wasn't it? I'd say more Morrisons. <laughs> 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 so, what would. A long way. About. A couple football Yeah. So, what would that be? Uh, 600 feet in all directions. The energy had increased that much. <coughs> Uh, this is uh, quite amazing stuff another friend of mine heard about the ark and she had a camera that took tape night vision I've got the film at home because it's on VHS uh, I can't bring it along and show you today I wish I had the film with me I wish I got it transferred I will at one point some point get it transferred to DVD 
we filmed the ark with night vision. We set it up in the living room and just filmed it. And then we left and let the film, let the camera run for a couple of hours. When that film was looked at, while we were in the living room, orbs appeared out of nowhere and were shooting across the ark. Strangely, only over this side of the ark. The orbs weren't as big as what you would see on photographs. They're like stars and they come, very, they come out of nowhere and go very, very fast in straight lines like that and like that and like that. And they shoot out everywhere. It's like a firework display. As soon as you get up, and leave the living room and let the ark to its own devices the orbs die away so that there's nothing as soon as you come back into the living room the orbs reappear and they appear like little stars and they're moving at an incredible speed they're not insects they're not like moths or anything like that because uh, when we did film it we did get a, a, a little moth flew across the screen and the flight pattern is slower and more erratic and these orbs are going in dead straight lines very very fast indeed so there appears to be some sort of symbiotic relationship between ourselves and the ark that is producing the manifestation uh, of this phenomena uh, it reacts to us it interacts with us and I find that uh, extremely exciting the ark in the Old Testament was the throne of God <coughs> and um, how much longer have I got it's quarter past six now minutes. thank you <coughs> the ark did all sorts of incredible things in the Old Testament when it was built the ark I, you notice that it's covered, it's got a blue cover on it. This is because in the Old Testament the ark was covered over with badger skins and with a blue cloth. Once the ark was built it was never seen by Israel again except on one day of the year, um, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest of Israel would go into the Holy of Holies where the ark was kept in the tabernacle and uh, he would offer the blood of a bull or a goat over the seat of the ark. Now this went on for a period of about 800 years. So though it might have started off a nice pretty gold looking object, it actually would have been caked in, in blood. The blood of 800 years of once, one day in every year when the high priest would sprinkle blood over the, over the ark. So it wouldn't have been a pretty looking object. When the ark was used, was, it was being carried through the wilderness, uh, they got to the River Jordan. And the ark always went ahead of the Israelites. It was carried always by these poles on the shoulders of priests. The uh, uh, remember, the original is much bigger, considerably bigger. And when they stepped into the River Jordan, uh, the, river the River Jordan parted, the land became dry, and Israel was able to go through. They march around the walls of Jericho, carrying the ark and blowing trumpets and the walls, as you know, come tumbling down. Now people say it was the resonance of the trumpets that brought the walls down. That's a lot of modern thinking about it. But um, it wasn't that, because uh, apparently archaeologists have excavated uh, the walls of Jericho, or have found the walls of Jericho, and it's as if they have slid, slidden straight down, like a, like a, almost like a, a lift, straight down into the ground. They haven't fallen out flat, they've fallen straight down. Some other forces at work here, not the force of sound, I would suggest it was the power that was operating with the original Ark of the Covenant. Whether you consider it to be the power of God or some other sort of power, I leave that choice up to you. <coughs> um, the Ark is, is, does all sorts of miraculous things. It's, it's used, it's taken out when there's battles to be fought. On one occasion, um, when Israel was not living right with God, they brought the ark out. The ark was captured by the Philistines but, uh, and put in the, temp in the Philistine temple of Dagon and uh, a fish god. And there, when they came back the next morning, the statue of Dagon had fallen over. They pick it up 
and uh, the next morning when they come in the, sm the statue of Dagon is smashed to pieces. Uh, furthermore, the Philistines, it said, because of the presence of the ark, are afflicted with boils and cancers and this sort of thing. <coughs> <coughs> And um, this goes on. Um, what was I going to say? So Mark does all sorts of miraculous things. And then finally Solomon comes along and builds a temple for the children of Israel. Or rather for the Ark of the Covenant for the children of Israel. A permanent dwelling. And Solomon becomes their greatest king. He's like Arthur enthroned in Camelot if you like. And the, the Ark of the Covenant is the Holy Grail. And the whole of the nation is in blessing and prosperity. And for 40 years, Israel becomes the greatest nation the world has ever seen. And Solomon himself started a mystery school. It says in, uh, one, in the first book of Kings, chapter 4, that um, kings would send their princes to Solomon to partake of his wisdom. Now, Solomon is a very interesting thing. And as I... Uh, preparing to give uh, a talk about a month ago I reprogrammed the ark with sound again and I was given an insight into Solomon's name here is Solomon S-O-L-O-M-O-N Solomon this is what I was shown Sol the sun here you have the Temple of the Sun. Then you have Om. The Cosmic Vibration. And then you have On. On is the Egyptian word for light. The temple of the sun, the cosmic vibration and the temple of light. And what I was shown was that one of the ways to activate the ark and the presence around the ark is to invoke the name Solomon. Now, this is a vibration that is not to be used lightly. No mantra uh, should ever be used lightly. But what I was shown is that um, because there's so much power in these mantras, the way I was shown was this. <coughs> so sound soul you pull the energy down with the on you take the energy in with the on you push the energy out use this and I've used it as a mantra not all the time I have to say but I have used it as a mantra in front of the arc and as you use it in front of the arc it sets up a vibration a resonance that corresponds with the arc the word Solomon, by the way, means beloved. It's a lovely name. It's the beloved. And um, if you want, as we finish, when we finish, if you, if you would like to chant with me uh, in front of the ark and, you know, just give the ark resonance and power. And who knows what you might take, what energy it might take with you. Now, people say, there's a lot of mystery about what happened to the original ark because there was an original ark this is only a copy remember the copy answers to the true one there is a true ark somewhere every nation had an ark the Egyptians version of it was Tutankhamun's um, this would be one of them this is an Egyptian ark it contained um, some of the internal organs of Tutankhamun in canopic jars uh, it is said, 
in, by some scholars that the Druids, when they came over to this country, brought a sacred box with them. Uh, in Greek, in Greece, you have the story of Pandora's box. Perhaps it's a memory of the Ark of the Covenant. In India, their sacred emblem is the lotus flower. It's the emblem of enlightenment. In the United States, it's very much the flag. The flag is known as Old Glory. For Israel, it was the Ark of the Covenant. That Ark got lost, as we know. And I don't have a, a, a lot of time to go into what became of the Ark. But the large degree of Freemasonry, the keystone being removed from the vaults beneath the Holy of Holies in Solomon's Temple, and you see the Ark is carefully concealed below Solomon's Temple. Maybe that's where the Ark is. Some people say it's in Ethiopia. Well, uh, that's an interesting theory, and when you watch documentaries, you will see um, that um, uh, a priest is there guarding this temple uh, where there's said to be the Ark. I personally don't think that's the case. I don't believe that Solomon would ever have parted with that Ark. It was the most sacred object in the whole of Israel. What they have is an Ark. It is a box, I believe, probably overlaid with gold, which probably contains the Torah, the sacred writings of the Hebrew people. Uh, in synagogues today, the cupboard in which the sacred law is kept is called an ark. So I don't think it's the ark of the covenant, it is an ark. The ark itself answers to that copy, answers to the original copy that Moses made. But as my wife Sarah pointed out to me, um, that ark answers, no, uh, Moses' ark answers to another ark on the astral realm. Would you like to say something about that? <coughs> I hope I've got this right then. If you have an object on this earth plane with which you are endeavouring to communicate with spirit, for example, the ark, the ark has a power, but that is only a copy of the ark that exists on the etheric realms, on the astral plane, in heaven, wherever you want to think about it. And this is the means whereby um, we can communicate with that other ark, which is on a higher dimension. This ark in itself is nothing, it's no more than a box, if you don't think of it as sacred. As soon as you think of it as a sacred object, you're thinking of it as sacred because it's answering to something in the, that's going on in the realm of spirit. And that is what makes it so. It is thinking, as Shakespeare said, that makes it so. And so, um, uh, and it's the same with all magical tools. Magical tools are only a, of any relevance if you realise that there is a magical tool in the realm of spirit to which the one you are holding in your hand or the one you're using, to which that one answers to. It would appear this arc in our weak and humble experiments with it, has a life force of its own. And it would appear, if it has a life force of its own, there are other copies in the world of the Ark, uh, built in, in various, by various people, uh, and in, held in certain academies and so forth. All those Arks would carry, basically, the same resonance, the same frequency. If they're alive, maybe they're in communication with each other. Maybe the arcs are all answering to one another. And in answering to one another, they're answering to that arc of Moses. And maybe that arc of Moses is answering to the one on the astral realms. And who knows what we might bring through as we link up with the arc. But not so much what we might bring through, what we might hear and what we might learn. Because what I am being taught at the moment it's not what I can do for spirit, but what spirit wants to do for me that counts. As for me, I have an appointment with the next dimension and I don't want to be late. Thank you for listening.
stargate and I, I had this crazy daydream of building a stargate in my living room and uh, which is <laughs> really mad stuff but I'm, I do mad things because I've always been interested in other dimensions and other planes of existence and how to contact them and uh, how to travel to those planes of existence and how they can travel to us. Uh, I began to think about this, um, building a Stargate. So I come back to Glastonbury uh, after my holiday and I meet Sue Chapman who um, runs or used to run the Glastonbury branch of the Wessex Research Group and she said I've been listening to an interview with a man called Kenneth Hutchison, he's into free energy, uh, lives in America and he's built a replica of the Ark of the Covenant and um, has run all sorts of tests and he claims he's had entities coming through and she said why don't you build one and we could run our tests you see on the ark and see what we get so I said well that's fantastic okay let's do it so I went off to B&Q and I went <laughs> <laughs> to get some wood and so forth and duly built it, which I will explain a little bit about it, uh, about the building of it in a, in a few moments. First of all, I should explain to those of you who maybe don't know what the Ark of the Covenant actually is. <laughs> well, good afternoon everybody and thank you for inviting me to give a talk today. My subject is the uh, Ark of the Covenant and to me it is Israel's Holy Grail. Now, uh, my interest in the talk began really many many years ago I considered in the 1970s writing um, making a replica of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in those days I was heavily involved in ch with church life and um, I was interested in the Ark and I began studying it then then I came out of the church and went on to a diff completely different path and I went on to began to explore other philosophies uh, and look into the movement and very quickly uh, found myself uh, drifting out of church. In fact, I left church completely in 1995 and began to study alternative philosophies, occult philosophies, and I found them really quite startling. Then in 2005, I began to read a wonderful book by James Hurtak called The Keys of Enoch. And while I was reading this book, I had a vision of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, which I thought was really nice. This was in the March. And then I was in Cyprus in the July uh, on a holiday, and I was just lounging around on a balcony watching the sunset over the Mediterranean, and I was musing on... Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was the holiest object in the nation of Israel when they were a nation this is during the times of King David and King Solomon those periods about um, 8 or 900 BC <coughs> now um, it was the throne of God when Israel uh, you probably know the story for those of you who have been to Sunday school Israel was held in bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh and Moses is raised up as a leader for the Israelite nation leads the people of Israel out of Egypt miraculously parting the Red Sea and they go through and they come to Mount Sinai and on Mount Sinai God puts in a experience and when you read that experience in the Bible it sounds like um, that wonderful scene at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind when that massive mothership comes down over the mountain well at Mount Sinai God put in that with thunder and lightning and the sound of trumpets uh, as he appeared and he goes up to the mountain and he gave him the Ten Commandments and uh, also gave him a, uh, a tabernacle to build, a tent, for God to live in, and he also gave him the pattern for a box, which is called the Ark. And this, was, uh, this box would be the box that would hold the Ten Commandments. And um, 
uh, it was it was a, the most sacred agreement between God and man, and the God of Israel was going would said he would enthrone himself above the ark. Now, <clears throat> here is the high priest uh, of Israel as he would be um, in the wilderness. Here's the children of Israel all camped up here in the wilderness. And this is the tent or tabernacle that Moses was commanded to build. And here we have the high priest preparing himself to go into the Holy of Holies where he would see the, th the uh, where he would meet with God in front of the Ark of the Covenant. <coughs> And uh, so he would be there and God would put in this personal appearance and reveal himself there. So the object itself was very, very powerful. It had a very powerful significance. This is where God was going to meet. This was where the other ones were going to touch the earth plane. And the notion that I had was that perhaps we too could, if we built the ark which is the most powerful esoteric object in the world, perhaps in the universe, maybe we will open up uh, a, uh, a way through to other dimensions. So, we duly set about building this ark. <coughs> um, now, I'll go into that one afterwards. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> so, I buy the wood. Because the, the Ark of the Covenant was made of acacia wood, um, which is an, a very, very strong wood. It's known as the eternal wood because it's so closely grained, it will almost not disintegrate at all. It will last forever, or virtually. Uh, so I go to B&Q and I get, the, um, I get some wood, uh, pine wood. I couldn't get acacia wood. It's very hard to get in this country. And I'm walking along the road with my pine wood up Glastonbury High Street and I bump into Colin who's a brilliant, brilliant carpenter. And I said, he said to him, oh, where are you going with that? I said, oh, you're not going to believe this but I'm going home to make the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and he said, oh yeah. He said, um, he said, how are you going to do that then? I said, well, really, I haven't got a clue. I'm not very good at carpentry. He said, well, I'll build it for you. So, knowing how good Colin was, I said, well, it has to be precise measurements. He said, don't worry about that. So, he set to and began to build it. Now, I will give a description to you of the Ark of the Covenant. This is um, what is actually what the Bible, the 